Maranatha. Christ is coming, amen? amen? Happy Sabbath, everybody. Welcome to uh, this third part of our series, this Revival Weekend series titled The Power of the Everlasting Gospel. Now, this Revival Weekend series that we are doing here is because maybe some of you know, maybe some of you don't know that in the fall, we are going to have a prophecy seminar here, Amen. And I have been invited to be the speaker at the Prophecy Seminar. And so I am excited. It's titled, the title might change, but this is the Babylon, America, and Bible Prophecy. And so this is going to be in the fall. It's going to be in collaboration with AFCO. So we're going to have the AFCO students. For those of you that don't know, AFCO is the Amazing Facts Center of Evangelism where we train people in evangelism, and so we're going to have between probably 30 and 40 students that are going to be participating with us during those three months, and uh, I was my privilege to do AFCO 10 years ago, actually. I remember the last time it was done was here, and uh, I was here. We worked directly with this church, so I'm excited about that. Who's excited about that? Amen? Amen. So that's going to be in the fall, so we're going to have a fun time as we go into Bible prophecy, and so... Uh, I want to share with you a quote as we begin. This is going to be the last presentation on this Weekend Revival series. It's not the last presentation in the series, but it is in the one that I will be sharing with you. And uh, I think it is probably the most important and crucial of all the revival messages that I share. So I'm going to read this quote with you. In a special sense, Seventh-day Adventists have been set in the world as watchmen and light bearers. To them or to us has been entrusted what? The last warning for a perishing world. The last warning. The last time God speaks about putting an end to this world of pain and sin and suffering, that's our job here on earth. We are not here to fill space. We are not here to run time by. The Seventh-day Adventist Church, we have a very specific purpose and reason for our existence, and it is to preach and proclaim and witness to the last warning for a perishing world. Now, where is that last warning for this perishing world? It says, they have been given a work of solemn importance, the proclamation of the first, second, and third angel's message. There is no other work of so great importance, and we are to allow nothing else to what? To absorb our attention. What is the purpose of the Seventh-day Adventists, my brothers and my sisters? The preaching and witnessing of the everlasting gospel and the three angels' message that is found in Revelation 14, 6 through 12, right? And I saw another angel flying in the midst of heaven having the everlasting gospel to preach to those who dwell on the earth, to every nation, tribe, tongue, and people. Amen? Amen. Saying with a loud voice, Fear God and give glory to him for the hours of his judgment has come and worship him who created the heavens, the earth, the sea, and the springs of water. That is the first angel leading into the second and third. In our prophecy seminar in the fall, we will be going through the three angels' message in great detail, point by point, breaking it down as we study, because that is the purpose that we are here for. Amen? Amen. And notice that this is exactly what Jesus Christ spoke about. Jesus talked about the everlasting gospel and the three angels' message in Matthew chapter 24, verse 14, when he said, the gospel of the kingdom will be what? Preached where? In all the world. To, as a what? As a witness. To who? To all nations, and then the end will come. So when you ask the question, Jesus, what gospel will be preached in all the world as a witness to all nations? Before the end, he's talking about what? He's talking about the three angels' message, amen? That is Matthew 24, 14, and Revelation chapter 13. I'm sorry, Revelation chapter 14, verse 6 are parallel verses. It's talking about the same Jesus was talking about this message that would be preached and witnessed. Amen? Amen? Now, I love this verse for another reason. Because this verse tells us the reason why we are still here. Right? Why, after 2,000 years, is the church still standing here? Why are we still here? Well, it says very clearly that the reason that we are still here is because of what? Because we have not been preaching or witnessing to the gospel. Because Jesus says that when we preach and witness to the gospel, then the end will come. So my brothers and my sisters, if the end hasn't come, why is that? Because we have been ineffective and inefficient at our job of preaching and witnessing the gospel. Everybody with me? 
And the gospel, the purpose of the gospel, my brothers and my sisters, is what? Is to manifest Christ in us, the hope of glory. That Christ, the faith of Christ, the life of Christ can be revealed in each and every one of us. That the glory of God will cover the whole earth, as it says in Revelation chapter 18, verse 1, and prepare the the world for the final battle that is to be upon the earth. Amen? Amen? This is the message. This is the mission. But... The church is what? Sleeping. The church looks like it's sleeping. The church doesn't look like it's having a big effect on this earth. When you think about it, we have been called to proclaim and witness to this three angels message, to this last warning, God's last warning to the earth. And we are but half than 1% of the population. Do you know that? We're less than 0.5% of the population in the world. And so the question then is, how is this message going to go out to every nation, tribe, tongue, and people because there's no other church preaching this message. How is this message going to go out to the whole world, prepare the world for the end, when we are less than half percent of the population? And you know that gets me excited. You know why? Because God is going to do an amazing work. God said it's going to happen, and that means it's going to happen. Amen? Amen? And so I'm excited to see what God is going to do that he's going to take a little tiny little group of people on this earth and blow the world up with the everlasting gospel and the three angels message. Wow. That's why he's going to get all the credit and all the glory and all the honor. Amen. Amen? Now, there has to be then a message for us because the church right now is asleep. We're, we don't see like we're doing much of that. Right now, the devil is in Punta Cana in, Republican, in Dominican Republic, sitting on a hammock, just sipping on a, on, a, on a piña colada. He's like, I don't got to worry about these people. <laughs> They're not doing anything to me. But when the devil sees that the church gets serious and the church gets on their knees and we start to desire that upper room experience and the afflicting of the soul and the devil starts to see the character of Christ and the faith of Christ reproduced and manifested in us, then he's going to get up off of that hammock, and then that's when the end is going to start. Is everybody with me? But there has to be something that is going to start and ignite this final movement that's going to reignite, that's going to revive the church to finish and fulfill the purpose. And here's another quote in regards to what, is, what message is going to do that. It says, I was asked the meaning of the shaking I had seen and was shown that it would be caused by the what? The straight testimony called forth by the counsel of the true witness to who? To Laodicea. I have a question for you. Who is Laodicea, my brothers and my sisters? We are. We are. Laodicea, the last stage of the church before Christ returns, is the message to Laodicea. And God is telling us that there's going to be what? There's going to be a what? A shaking in the church. The church is going to be shaken to its core before all the final events come. It's going to shake the church. And that message that's going to shake the church is what message? The message to the church of Laodicea. Now notice what's going to happen when this message starts to be proclaimed with power. It says some will not bear the straight testimony. That's number one. Some will not what? Bear it. Number two, some will what? Rise up against it. And this will cause a shaking among God's people. The testimony of the true witness has not, has been, has not been what? Half heeded. So some are kind of listening to it. Some are like, no. The solemn testimony upon which the testimony of the church hangs has been what? Lightly esteemed, if not what? Entirely disregarded. So the message of the Laodicea based off of these quotes is what? Some are not going to bear it. Some are going to rise up against it. Some are going to be like, yes, it's it's not that important. And some are going to be like, it doesn't matter. Now, to be able to understand what is the problem that we have and how God is going to revive us so that we can finish this work, where do we need to go, my brothers and my sisters? We need to go to study what? The church of Laodicea or Laodicea. Is everybody with me? And so the presentation this morning is titled, An Unwanted Guest. 
Go with me, please, to the book of Revelation, to the message of the church of Laodicea or Laodicea. Revelation chapter 3. Revelation chapter 3. We are going to study. Now, we, I have a full revival series that I have just on the Laodicean church. We don't have time for all of that. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to give you what is, I consider to be the most important, foundational, fundamental part of the Laodicean message so that we can prepare for our own personal revival, our church revival, that we can prepare to finish this work. Who says amen? Revelation chapter 3, because in the fall, my brothers and my sisters, we are going to invade Sacramento. Who says amen to that? Get excited. And so God is going to need an army of people that is going to be ready for that invasion. And you are part of that army. And so how is God going to wake us up? Revelation chapter 3, everybody there? Verse number 14, and it says, And to the angel of the church of the Laodiceans write, these things says the amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. Who is speaking here? Christ. Christ is speaking, right? Christ is speaking. He is the faithful and true witness to the love of God, to the character of God. He is the amen. He is the beginning of the creation of God. Now, that doesn't mean that he is the first created beings, as many people believe that, oh, he was the first created being. No. What it says there, he is, the word beginning is the Greek word ark, which is he is the head of of creation. Amen? He is the one that is the creator, as it says. He is the eternal. He is the one that was with God from the very beginning. Amen? Which has no beginning because God is eternal. And so this is Jesus Christ speaking. And notice what he says in verse number 15. He says, I know he's speaking to you and to me. Remember, this is a message to the church. This is not a message to the Gentiles, to the pagans, to the atheists, to the non-believers. This is a message to you and to me, to the church in this end time. And it says in verse number, four, uh, number 15, I know your works, that you are neither cold nor hot. I wish you were cold or hot, so then because you are what? lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, here it comes. What does Jesus say he's going to do? I will vomit you out of my mouth. Or if you have the King James Version, it says, I will spew you. Now, there are two things in this world that I am utterly disgusted by. Cockroaches and vomit. All right? The most disgusting things to me. When I learned that shrimp was the cousin of the cockroach, no more shrimp for me. That's how disgusting it was. And I love shrimp, right? I'm like, that's it. Disgusting. And it, it's not that a cockroach really does anything. They're just, ugh, they're just disgusting, right? Just to see them, it's like, ugh. And then vomit. Whew. I don't know about you, but I can't see somebody vomiting. I can't smell vomit, or I can't hear somebody vomit, because then what happens? Then I want to vomit, right? And I hate vomiting. I'd do anything not to vomit. Praise God, the health reform. I have not vomited since I've become and been following the health reform. Amen? Because when you put what's right in your body, your body's not going to reject it. Amen. Now, Jesus, when he says, I'm going to vomit you, I'm like, he's got my attention. He has got my attention because I'm like, man, that is disgusting. Jesus is going to vomit us? Now, why do you vomit something? Why do you vomit something? Because what is your body? Your body is doing what? It's rejecting that which you have introduced into it. Your body is saying, I don't like this, and it's repulsive to your body, and so your body is ejecting and rejecting that which you have just put inside of it. Now, the Bible says that we are the body of Christ. And so when we are inserted into the body of Christ, it says here, Jesus says, because of your lukewarmness, I'm going to what? Vomit you out of my mouth. That means that what? What does that mean? That he is disgusted by us. Whew. He is disgusted by us. And so what's the question? The question should be, is this me? Could he be disgusted by me? Now we have a legalistic tendency when we see this about, oh, I know who the lukewarm one is. And we start to look over there. This person over here, right? This person over here is the lukewarm person, right? And then what do we do? We like to take out our SDA checklist. We talked about this last night. We pull out our little SDA checklist and be like, oh, huh? 
I go to church on the day the Bible says, bing, one point for me. Oh, I don't eat unclean meats, bing. Oh, I go on mission trips, bing. Oh, I do my tithes and offering, bing. I go to Sabbath school, bing, bing, bing. And we're always looking at ourselves and be like, man, I'm, I'm a good Christian. You want extra brownie points? I'm vegan. Bing! I'm ready. And the Bible tells us that there is only one person in the Bible that makes a list of the good things they do and the bad things they don't do. And who is that? The Pharisee. That's legalism, my brothers and my sisters. And I said last night, if you have your little SDA checklist and you're like, oh, man, look at this. God, I'm ready to look at, oh, God. You burn that list, amen? Because it has nothing to do with what you're doing. It has to do with what is God doing in you. Because you could be doing all the right things for all the wrong reasons. Now, those things are not bad in itself. Don't come up here and now say, oh, Carlos said that that's not good. No, 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 no. Those are good things. But the reason is, what are the motivations and intentions behind why you're doing those things? That's the issue. And that's the core of the Laodicean message. It's going into the heart and finding out what's at that core, dark corners of your heart, the intentions and motivations by which you are doing the things you're doing. Because you might be doing the wrong things for the wrong reasons. In the same way, there are people that are doing the wrong thing for the right reasons. And God, those people that have their heart there, God will direct their ways and lead them to the truth. Amen? Amen. Let's continue to read. Verse number 17. Because you say, I am rich and have become wealthy and have need of nothing, right? Who are these? These are the people that have their little SDA checklist and be like, man, I'm good to go. And not only have I become rich, in the Bible, the concept of rich has to do with love and faith, right? Love and faith, agape love, unconditional love, which has to be imparted from God because it is not inherent in us and the faith of Jesus Christ. That is a gift from God. But what did the Laodicean lukewarm say? Oh, look at me. Look at my checklist. Come on. Right? And Jesus says, what does he answer to them? What does he say in verse number 17? But you do not know that you are what? Wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. So the question is, what's the question again? What's the question again? Come on, what's the question? Could this be me? Let me ask it again. What's the question, my brothers and my sisters, when we're reading this? What's the question? You remembered. Good, good, good job. Amen. Could this be me that he's speaking about? Come on. I'm an evangelist. I work for Amazing Facts, right? Oh, I'm the AFCO director. Oh, I travel around the world and preach. I give Bible studies. Oh, oh. And could I be full of myself? Could I be deceived? Is everybody with me? Could you be deceived? Because that's the question. It's not like, oh, this isn't me. This is talking about that person. If you're pointing your finger at somebody else, you are perfectly under the category of a lukewarm Christian. Because one of the categories of a lukewarm Christian is judging and pointing the fingers at others. And so, the question is, could this be me? Now, it says here, it gives us five things that Jesus is warning us about in verse number, in verse number 17. It says what? What does it say? Wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. That's a, that's a, that's a revival series right there. I'm going to zoom in on only one which is blind, all right? I'm going to zoom in on only one of these, blind. Why blind? Because what's the problem with being blind? You can't see. So if we're blind to our true condition, that's a problem. So the question that we're going to ask ourselves, what's the question we're going to ask ourselves today? Am I blind? Is this me? Am I deceiving and fooling myself thinking I come to church I dress up all nice. I got my Bible in my hand. And could we be deceiving ourselves, fooling ourselves? Because there's nothing worse than a person that can't see. In Spanish, it says, no hay peor ciego que el que no quiera ver. There's not a worse blind person than the one that doesn't want to see. And so that's the purpose of this message. It's to what? It's to open our eyes to our true condition. 
both individually and corporately as a body. Is everybody with me? Let's continue to read. Verse number 18. Now Jesus says, I counsel you to buy from me gold refined in the fire. That's the faith of Jesus and the agape unconditional love. That you may be rich and white garments that you may be what? Clothed, right? Why? Because we're naked, because we're going around in our own righteousness and we're not living in the righteousness of Christ. That you, the shame of your nakedness may be covered, may, may not be revealed, and anoint, here's the point. Remember, we're focusing on what it means to be blind. And to what? Anoint your eyes with what? With eye salve that you may see. Now, if Jesus is telling us that we may see, it's because we are blind. And so we need what? We need God to anoint the Holy Spirit to anoint us with the eye salve so that we may see. Is there hope still for the lukewarm Christian? Yes or no? Verse number 19. As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Therefore, be zealous and, and repent. Now watch this. If Jesus is asking the church in the end time to repent, what does that imply? What do you repent from? So what is he saying? If he's asking us to repent, what he's saying is you're living in sin. Could sin be the problem? Was sin not a problem for Achan? And God with his army? Could I be the Achan in the camp whose sin is not permitting and letting the church to continue to grow and fulfill its purpose? Could I be the one? Could my sins? But you know what the problem is? We're blind to our sin. We don't see it. He's saying, I need you to what? I need you to anoint myself so that you can repent so that you can see your true condition, that you can repent from your sins, that I can turn you away from them, and that I can do what? That I can do the work that I need to do in you and through you. Amen? Now here's the question. How is he going to do that? I'm blind. How is he going to help me to see my true condition if I'm blinded by it? I can't see it, so that means I need what? I need some exterior help, right? Right? I need someone or something to show me because I'm not aware of my blindness. And you know where the answer is? My question was, God, how are you going to show me my blindness? How are you going to show us our blindness? And you know where the answer is? In the very next verse. Look at what it says. Chapter 3, verse 20. Behold... I stand at the door and what? And knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and dine with him and he with me. Let's stop here for a second. It says here, Jesus says that I come to the door and what? And knock. Now I have a question. If Jesus is knocking at the door, what does the door represent? The heart or our life, right? He's knocking on our heart, on our life. But where is Jesus knocking at? He's knocking at the door. That implies that he is where? Oh, he's on the outside. He's not inside of my life. He is outside of my life. Now, that is huge implications. Because what we're saying is, you call yourself a Christian, I call myself a Christian, and I say Christ is my Savior, but where is he in my life? On the outside of it. He's not on the inside. And so you ask yourself, is God part of your life, or is God your life? There's a huge difference. You see, I've heard, I've heard popular preachers Say it. And I've actually heard a, a, a Seventh-day Adventist preacher say this one time. I almost fell off my seat. They say, this is what they say. You know what? You live a good life. You have a good life. You have a good job. You have a beautiful home, beautiful family. You have nice cars. You, have, you take nice vacations. You have your little investment portfolios. You know, you have a really good life. All you're missing is Christ. That's what they say. 
Like if Christ is some type of cherry that we put on top of the cake, and that is blasphemy, because all of those things are going to burn. And so Christ is not the cherry we put on the cake. Christ is the cake. He is the cake maker. Amen? But we present it as if he's some accessory to our, Christ, to our life here on earth. He's just some part that we need to add on it to, right? Is Christ part of your life or is he your life? And there's a huge difference in your experience in regards to that. And so notice, where is he? He's on the outside. He's not inside of our lives. Now, this is convenient. Think about this. I started to think about this. Why do we have him on the outside and not on the inside? Why do we even have him at the door? You see, it's, it's convenient for us to have him on the outside and not on the inside. Now, why not on the inside? I saw this door frame a while ago, and it's Jesus at the door, and he's like, I saw that. Now, I don't know about you, but that's kind of spooky, Right? Like, that's how, we, that's how we picture God and Jesus. Like, he's watching, watch, I see what you're eating. I see what you're watching on TV. Oh, 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 let me turn it off. Like, if God is, like, hovering over us and be like, oh, you bad, don't do that. We talked about this last night, so I'm not going to go into the details. But you see, this is how we picture God. And who would want that inside of the house? Somebody watching over you, telling you all the time what to do and what not to do. Ooh, that's spooky. That's how we present God to the world. Do you know that? But it's convenient not to have him on the inside because I don't want him telling me what I have to do and not to, but it's also convenient to have him where? On the outside. Why is it convenient to have him on the outside? Who can tell me? Because if an emergency shows up, I need to call Jesus, right? So he's on the outside. He's like a watchdog. You have people that live in the country, they all usually have dogs to, to, to make, rawr, 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 say somebody's showing up, you, you, you hear it. So it's convenient to have Jesus, so one, he can warn us if something bad is coming, or two, if I get into a personal emergency, I can open the door. And I say, Jesus, come inside, help me with my problem. He's like that emergency button. Come in, Jesus. I want you inside so you can help me because I got sick or because I have this problem or that problem. And then guess what? Once the problem is solved, what do we do with Jesus? Kick him right back outside. 